Section 1. You will hear Telephone conversation between a customer and a sales assistant at a shop that rents bicycles. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, Clark Cycle Hire. My name's Keith. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I saw your ad in the local paper and as I'm thinking of doing some cycling, I'm wondering what kinds of bike you have and what your prices are like. Well, we hire out two main types of machine, touring and mountain bikes. Are you likely to be riding off-road, do you think? No, I'll probably be sticking to roads and country lanes, so a touring bike would be best, I think. Right, well, the rate will be £50 for a week or £14 per day. So it's a lot cheaper to rent by the week? Yes, definitely. Though it's important to bring the bike back on time, otherwise I'm afraid we have to charge a late return fee. And how much is that? For each additional hour, it's £1.25. So, if you were a day late, it would cost another £30? Yes, that's right. I'd make sure I didn't do that, then. <laughs> I should also point out there's a deposit which you get back when you return the bicycle. In good condition, of course. On touring models, it's £60. Is there anything else I'd have to pay? No, that's it. Though, if you're planning to ride fairly long distances, you might like to have one or two accessories. Such as? Well, for another £5, we can supply lightweight bags, either panniers or the handlebar sort. It's amazing how much they can carry, and the way they're designed means they don't get in the way when you're riding. Well, I'll see. But what about essential things like a pump and a repair kit? I wouldn't have to pay extra for those, would I? No, no, no. There's no charge for things like that. Or for a lock. It's a good strong one, too. Just make sure you don't lose the key. That reminds me, what about insurance? What happens if someone steals the bike, in spite of the wonderful lock? Didn't I mention that? Oh, I, I should have told you that's included in the rental too. And it covers everything, does it? Uh, it covers you against theft of the bike, yes, as long as it's securely locked at the time. You'd have to pay part of any individual claim, though. How much? If the bike was stolen and not recovered, you'd be liable for the first £100. Hmm, so, if I do go ahead and rent one, how do I pay? By cheque or would it have to be cash? Uh, neither, I'm afraid. We can only accept credit card bookings. Otherwise, we'd have to ask our customers for the full value of the machine as a deposit. I've got a visa in my name. Would that be OK? Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. So if I want to have a look at the bikes, how do I find you? I live near the university, by the way. Right. First you take Woods Road as far as the main police station. I know it. It's right next to the park. Yes, that's it. And after the police station, there's a turning to the right called Oak Street. At the big supermarket? Uh, no, it's before then. It's actually between the police station and a garage on the other side. OK. So, you go down Oak Street until you reach the health centre on the right. If you get to a pub called the Maple Leaf, you've gone too far. All right? Yes, I've got that. Now, opposite the health centre, there's a pharmacy, and we're just behind that. OK. Fine. I'll try to call over sometime tomorrow. Great. See you then. Bye. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section 2. You will hear an extract from a radio program for people who live abroad. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Listen and answer questions 11 to 17. You're listening to Expat News, a weekly broadcast for the English-speaking community in this great city. In today's programme, we'll be hearing from Tom O'Hara, who's going to tell us about all those different associations he can join. Tom. Good evening. Yes, in a city with so many of its residents born outside the country, it's hardly surprising there's such a huge range of expatriate clubs and societies. And many of these, of course, are aimed at English speakers. So, first, and perhaps most obviously, we have the sports clubs, which in some cases field teams in things like rugby and tennis that compete against clubs in other parts of the country, or even abroad. You don't have to play at this level to have fun, though. They can be just a great way to do some exercise. And, of course, to get to know other people, especially if you're new in town. The same can be said of the many hobby and interest clubs that have sprung up here. Everything from landscape photography, such as the Viewfinders Club in the Harbour District, or focus on the airport road, to old favourites like stamp collecting. Remember that this country has a long tradition of unusual and perhaps even eccentric societies, so there should be something for everyone. A place where you can meet people of different nationalities with the same social and or cultural interests as you. For those who may be interested in rather more than just friendship, there's a wide range of lively social clubs. Several singles associations organise dancing of various kinds, while, for people in a real hurry, there's speed dating, in which everyone talks to everyone else for just five minutes. Then, at the end, they decide which of them they would like to meet again by ticking their names on a list. In complete contrast to these are the many religious associations, reflecting the diversity of faith groups present in this multicultural city. Many of them, of course, have their own places of worship, Perhaps also of interest to those who've come here from other parts of the world are the international and cultural societies. These often provide a meeting place for people from a specific country, China, for instance, and particular ethnic groups, such as Afro-Caribbeans. As in other major cities, we have here local branches of many charities with names familiar around the world. Meetings of human rights organisations like Amnesty International are held regularly in English, as are those of environmental groups such as Greenpeace. All funds raised, by the way, go to the same kinds of good cause as they do in other countries you may have lived in. Inevitably, perhaps, there are also the political clubs, often connected with a particular party and, indeed, a particular country. So we have, for example, a local association of Republicans linked to and campaigning for that party in the US, and Liberal Democrats here doing the same for their party in Britain. Finally, on a lighter note, there's plenty to choose from in the performing arts. Whether you enjoy taking part or just watching and listening, you can take your pick from a whole range of groups. To take just a couple of examples, there's Light Opera at the Memorial Hall in the city centre, or a very lively amateur theatre company in the Park District. In summer, they give open-air performances of Shakespeare plays, free of charge. Now you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20.
Now answer questions 18 to 20. I should mention at this point that clearly some districts have a higher concentration of English-speaking clubs than others, and that certain parts of town tend to specialise in particular activities. An obvious example would be the number of water sports clubs down near the river. Whatever the number, though, they usually have one thing in common. With the exception of a few associations linked to particular countries and supported by their embassies here, in the vast majority of cases, it is the individual members who fund them, so an entry fee or a subscription will be charged. You may be used to council-subsidised sports centres and the like in your home country, but I'm afraid that's not the case here. Assuming you can afford it then, you can be fairly sure that somewhere out there you'll find a club that caters for your own particular fascination. If it's very important to you and you intend to spend a lot of time on it, it might even determine which district of the city you decide to live in. In the unlikely event that you really can't find such a club, the solution is to try to persuade friends and anyone else you meet of the need for one. You could also use the local small ads on the internet to suggest the idea. You'll be amazed at just how many people share even the strangest interest. Then you can start your own. That is the end of section to you now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You'll hear two university students discussing a social science lecture they attended. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Did you go to the first social science lecture yesterday? Yeah. Didn't you see me there? No. I was trying so hard to understand the lecturer. What didn't you understand? A lot of it, really. For example, he said we needed to study history as part of the course, but I didn't get why. You probably missed it. He said early on that we need to learn from our past mistakes. Right. But he also said we need to put ourselves in the place of our ancestors. Why is that? I think the point is that it's not enough to know how they lived and what they did. We need to know what they thought. I see. And I've written transferable skills in my notes next, but I have no idea what that means. If you study social science, you learn skills that you can use in a job. Oh, right. Is that all? Okay, but why is that? The point he made was that in studying social science, you use a flexible and adaptable approach to learning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. He also kept mentioning all the other subjects we will need to study as part of the course. I didn't write them all down, did you? 
some of them. I think I can make sense of my notes. The first one was anthropology, which he said would cover prehistory and archaeology as well. Okay. Then there's economics. I wrote down that this was not meant to mean that we will spend all our time looking at economic theory, but more that we need to see how humans behave. That's good. I don't think I could handle economic theory. He said something about education too, didn't he? Yeah. He said we'll be looking at how cultural information is handed down from one generation to the next through teaching children. He said we'd be focusing on geography too, but I can't really remember which aspects. Can you? I noted it down, I think. Here we are, yes, particularly in relation to urban planning. It's law that I got confused about. I didn't understand why he linked that to economics. I think he meant that laws affect the way wealth is distributed. That makes sense. Now, what are the science wars? Okay, I did get that. The science wars are about how social science collects information. In sociology and social work, and in social science generally, they can only study patterns of behavior and observe. If you compare that to the way scientists work in physics or chemistry, it's very different because they use specific experiments that can be tested and which give concrete answers. Social studies is often accused of being unscientific. That's all. Okay, but it still looks like a good course, doesn't it? You don't have any regrets, do you? None at all. I'm looking forward to it. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about America in the 1960s. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 37. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 37. We begin our examination of America in the 1960s with the usual caution. There is no sense in trying to understand any decade without looking at what came before. Those of you who still have outstanding coursework on the 1950s would do well to complete it now if for no other reason then it will help make sense of the next series of lectures. But we must press on, and I'd like to begin my talk about the 60s with a reference to one of those things that came before, the post-war baby boom. With the end of the Second World War in 1945, there began in the USA an era of perceived prosperity and security. In short, people started to feel that the world was a much better and safer place to bring up children. So, at the start of the 60s, all those children born in the baby boom, 70 million in the U.S. alone, were teenagers. As the 60s progressed, and as this large number of people approached adulthood, there was a noticeable shift in the balance of power.
and young people began to have a voice in ways that were not considered possible in the more conservative atmosphere of the preceding decade. Things were moving forward at a rapid pace. The literature of the time brought out all the taboos. Everything was covered, such as race in, for example, the book To Kill a Mockingbird. The role of women changed, and uh, equality for women, well, let's just say that once certain books were published, women were no longer going to be satisfied with their roles as devoted wives and mothers. Through literature alone, the whole fabric of society was challenged, and by the end of the 60s, things would never again be as they had pretty much been for the preceding 40 years. It was a decade of protest, civil rights protests, feminism, the rights of minorities, the Vietnam War. All these causes led to peaceful and not-so-peaceful protests on college campuses and elsewhere. People had been given freedom of speech and they were going to use it. The crime rate rose to nine times what it was in the 50s as respect for the old order faded away. But it was also a time of great development. In medicine, the 60s saw the first heart transplant. In technology and the space race, where we saw the first American in orbit and lasers being invented at the start of the decade, and the first man on the moon, and the first primitive internet at the end. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 38 to 40. None of this, good or bad, might have happened if things in 1962 had gone slightly differently. On October 16th, President John F. Kennedy met with his closest advisors at the White House. They had obtained photographic evidence showing that Cuba was building or installing nuclear weapons. It was widely believed that Cuba was preparing to fire these weapons at cities in the USA. Kennedy was faced with three choices. To try to resolve the crisis diplomatically by negotiating with Cuba and the Soviet Union. To take action to block the delivery of more weapons into Cuba. Or to attack Cuba, destroying their weapons. Believing that the first option would end in failure and that the third option would lead to war, it was the second option that Kennedy chose. In doing so, he succeeded in preventing the buildup of more missiles. The Soviet Union then withdrew the weapons from Cuba. Most historians agree that if Kennedy had acted differently, the episode would have led to a full-scale nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. Millions would have died, and the world would have been changed beyond recognition. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.